Hi everyone, I'm Heidi Massey and um, I have my own consulting company um, called Community Connective and uh, I do all kinds of things with nonprofits including some Google Ads work and strategic planning and racial equity work. And my name is Prana Abby Scanlon and I also have a consulting group. It's called Moxie Consultancy Collaborative and there we do consultancy projects primarily around diversity, equity, and inclusion. We also do events like workshops and um, trainings and we also provide one-on-one -on -one coaching. And we also were part of a, a team that created something called Envisioning Equity and I know some of the Shy Hack Night team came to the first conference. Uh, that was uh, Envisioning Equity, Strategic Planning for Inclusive Organizations. And it was a conference aimed primarily at nonprofits to figure out how to deal with some of the uh, not equitable things going on within their organizations. And that's sort of how we ended up here today. Uh, Derek had, and Monique had asked us to come speak um, because Shy Hack Night is interested in becoming a more equitable organization and needed a place to start. So Heidi and I are here to share a little bit about that. Um, we're gonna be talking about some difficult things today, as you might imagine, things that might make you feel a little bit uncomfortable. And we wanna say that you don't have to ignore the fact that you might be feeling uncomfortable. Instead, we invite you to notice it, and we invite you to think about what's making you uncomfortable, because often that feeling comes from hearing something that just runs contrary to what we've been taught or what we know and what's familiar. And we're gonna talk more about that tonight and why what we've always known isn't necessarily what's the best thing to do. Um, especially from the perspective of the people who are least often supported. So we are going to jump right in with a little activity. Who here can easily jump on down to Walgreens or Target and immediately find a Band-Aid that matches their skin tone? <laughs> Some of you are lying. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> And then uh, anybody who is of a certain age, how many of you remember flesh-colored crayons? Mm. <laughs> Whose flesh color is that? Yeah, right, exactly. Or if, if you wear makeup and you go to the makeup counter, there's nude makeup that's supposed to match your skin tone, right, nude? Now that always works for me. I don't know if it works as well for Prana. No, <laughs> quite a trial and error process. Um, who here, has e oh, who here has ever been the only person of your race or ethnicity when going to a tech event? <laughs> yeah, huh? Mm -hmm. Okay. I think we need the next slide. Okay, we're gonna spend a little bit of time talking about some terms because anytime you do a racial equity or diversity, equity, inclusion, all those words we're gonna talk about, Anytime you go to any kind of training like that, if it's a good training, they're going to start with definitions. Otherwise, they're going to use words and you're not all going to agree with what those words mean. So what Prana and I were trying to demonstrate first is this idea of default white culture. So default white um, means that whiteness is seen as normal. And so white people, uh, people are white. And then black people and brown people are sort of a special category of people. But when you're talking about people, you're talking about white people. Um, and then implicit bias is what happens when we experience over and over and over again this default white culture. Um, whether it's um, turning on the news and it's all white people that are on the TV, or the white band-aids or whatever else, those things happen over and over again. And then when we do see something that is not about white people, it's not always very positive or it's exotic or it's, you know, it's not normal in the same way that white people are just viewed as normal. So we develop this sort of bias um, that makes us think a certain way. And because of that, 
We thought this was a great website. <laughs> and we encourage you to check it out. If you can't see from the back, it says rent a minority. It's rentaminority.com. So we thought this was funny because I, I'm sure most of you have experienced in the spaces where you work because of um, these things that we've talked about, uh, default whiteness and implicit bias, we see a lack of people of color being hired, being promoted, being on boards of organizations and companies. It impacts who gets interviewed, who gets a prominent promotion, who gets a raise. Um, you see a lack of people of color as keynote speakers. You see them lacking on panels. Um, it impacts who gets VC funding because as Heidi said, Implicit bias impacts whose story gets told and how it gets told and what people are familiar with. So all of those are things to consider. Um, we had asked you to think about um, racism and what your definition of racism is. I don't know if anybody wants to share quickly what their definition of racism is. Any brave volunteers? Nope, that's okay. Racism is prejudice plus power. You need to have both pieces, right? So um, that's why there's no such thing as reverse racism, because people of color don't have that societal power to push that prejudice into racism. So, go to the next slide. Racism is like this iceberg. We see it, it's jutting out of the water. Here are some obvious examples, right? Neo-Nazis, hate crime, slavery, the KKK using the N-word, right? We know that's there. Actually, icebergs go much deeper than you can ever see, and there's more under the water than there is over the water. That's how icebergs work. So there's a ton of racism happening under the water that we maybe don't think about, or some of us think about, and some of us don't. Lots of examples here, hate crimes, mass incarceration, but I don't see race, police brutality, Eurocentric curriculum in schools, cultural appropriation, housing discrimination, voter suppression, stop and frisk, health disparities, hiring practices, generational wealth, bootstrap mentality, expecting people of color to teach white people everything, tokenism, white savior complex. We could go on all day on what's on this side of the iceberg under the water. So you, you all have a diversity, equity, and inclusion committee. Um, and so a lot of times the focus is on diversity. And I want to make sure that we understand what those three words mean. Um, I love when I hear somebody say, oh, they're a diverse individual. And it doesn't work because diversity is about groups and having a lot of different kinds of people in the groups, whether it's gender, sexual preference, um, religion, race, all of that. I can't be a diverse person. So don't use the term diverse person. It's just another way to be default white, to say, I'm white, I'm normal, you're diverse because you're not white. It's about a group that doesn't all look and act and is the same uh, as each other. Um, so that's diversity. Equity means that we are going to guarantee fair treatment across opportunity and advancement while working to identify and eliminate barriers that prevent full particip participation of some. So essentially, I know that's a, a word salad. It means that everybody has the same opportunities, and not only the same opportunities, but the same opportunities to get the same at the same outcomes, regardless of what their identity is. So it takes into, into account historical stuff that has happened. It's not just about today, it's about what's happened in the past and what may happen in the future. And you notice we're not talking equality. Equality is just a blanket, everybody gets the same thing. And it doesn't take into account that sort of separate 
um, experience that happens. And then inclusion is creating an environment where individuals or groups feel welcomed and they feel respected and supported and valued and that they can fully participate. And then here's the part that we don't always think about, that they can bring their full authentic selves um, into their workplace or wherever else. So you see all those laws about um, hairstyles that are accepted in work and not accepted in work. That's a great example of not being inclusive. So I wanna talk about one other thing. Um, a lot of organizations start with, token, with um, diversity because they think, oh, we need to hire people of color. And the first thing I say to them is, nope, don't even start because you're just gonna have a revolving door you're just gonna have people coming and going, and then you're gonna say, we tried, it doesn't work. <laughs> you have to do the work first, and as you do the work, the result will be a diverse workforce. If you do diversity first, you're gonna be out of luck. Okay, fragility. I would venture to guess that every single person in this room um, has felt fragile at some point or another. Um, we all screw up, every single one of us, and we all have some sort of power or privilege in some circumstances. And so that fragility is that discomfort and that defensiveness that we feel when we have some power in a situation and we're confronted with some information about how we are act acting inequitable. Um, and we feel that sort of like, oh no, I didn't do that. I didn't do that, I'm okay. Um, so there's, there's a woman by the name of Tema Oaken who created um, white supremacy culture and it's 16 characteristics that show up primarily in organizations and when people come together. Um, things like binary thinking, it's either or. Um, power hoarding, you know, people are really consumed with being in charge or being the boss and being an individual, which is something that a lot of groups don't have the luxury of being, but in our organizations, you know, we have to be the individual and not be part of the group um, in terms of ideas and credit and things like that. So there are three ideas um, that Tema Oaken has in this piece, and tell me if you can't hear me, I'm moving this around. Um, there are three ideas that, three um, characteristics that Tema Oaken has on this, on this document that to me are really the three-legged stool that undergird the whole system, and it's perfectionism, defensiveness, and a right to comfort. So perfectionism meaning we cannot make mistakes, we must be perfect. Um, I would guess if I said who feels that pressure at work, just about everybody in the room is gonna raise their hand because you feel like, oh my God, I have to cover up mistakes or they're gonna fire me or they're going to something. We gotta be perfect, right? And because we feel that pressure to be perfect, the minute anytime anybody brings us criticism or constructive feedback, we feel defensive because it shows we're not perfect. And when we get that way, we think they're to blame and why are they making me feel so uncomfortable? And so when you have those three that are so firmly entrenched where we work, you can't ever change anything because nobody's gonna take a risk. Nobody can make a mistake and we're just stuck forever in the place where we're at. So I really, I have the link here. You share the PowerPoint, right? Um, so the link is in the PowerPoint, so you can check it out. People read it and they're blown away because it's just so accurate. Um, I also I want to take one second and just talk, Prana, you talked about being brave, I think. Um, the idea is that if you're a person with power in any situation, we talk a lot about safe space, and it's kind of BS, especially for people with power. There's no way, especially today, that we can guarantee anybody's safety. And as a white privileged person, um, I can use the idea of I don't feel safe by what you're saying to block any feedback from someone that I may have harmed. So I'm gonna really push people tonight and going forward to try and exist in a brave space where you are 
embracing the idea where you can of making mistakes and then owning them. I think we ought to have a celebration, ring a gong, anytime somebody says, oh, I feel uncomfortable, and we can all applaud and say, you're about to learn something, way to go, well done. Um, and when people make mistakes, we should have an opportunity when they approach it with grace and humility to say, well done, you know, you made a mistake, well done that you followed up that way. Um, so people get a little unsure about brave space because frequently people of color have to live in brave space all the time, every day. Um, but for those of us who are of privilege and are not put in a position of having to be brave all day, every day, I think we got to embrace it and, and do the best we can to be brave. So we talked about what we're talking about, how it impacts us, and now, so what? Uh, the first thing that we want to mention is the first priority of doing diversity, equity, and inclusion work is to eliminate the harm that is caused to marginalized people. And to do this, that means that we need to center marginalized people, starting with black and indigenous folks and other people of color. And what that means is, especially, that educating white folks is a tactic, but it's not the purpose. It's not the only reason that we're here to do this work, and it's not the primary reason that we're doing this work. The primary reason is to center the people who are being harmed the most, and that is why we lead with race. I first want to put a big exclamation point after what Prana said. I learned it a long time ago, but it was really driven home for me recently, and it changes how I view everything. That our point is not just to educate white people. Our point is to focus on how we can make spaces safer for marginalized people. Like, you said it so well. Um, we lead with race. And why do we lead with race? Because race undergirds the whole system. It's the most complicated kind of oppression to dismantle. If we don't lead with the most complicated form, it's a really complicated, it's a really crowded table, obviously, of oppression, and race gets shoved off the table. And then what happens is you've got people who are oppressed, who are white, who monopolize the conversation, and we never get to race. So we always have to start with race. Through an intersectional lens, meaning through looking at all the other kinds of oppression, but looking at it through the lens of people of color, um, and primarily black indigenous people, um, because that's where we're gonna do the most good. Um, and the other thing is that, uh, no, I said it all, we're good. Our second tip is that we need to recognize that this work is ongoing. This work is not one and done, you didn't come to this presentation and you got your certificate on racism 101, I'm, I'm a great ally now. No, absolutely not. <laughs> and that's because this work is systemic and it's interpersonal. Racism pervades everything that we do, as Heidi was saying, it undergirds the whole system. And that means that we're gonna probably, sorry, we're probably gonna be doing it forever, for the rest of our lives. We're gonna be working to undo this really complicated system that impacts every single facet of our lives. And that, that goes for all of us, that goes for me, it goes for Heidi, it goes for every single one of you, it goes for this organization. Um, I, do I need to say more about systemic? I don't think so, okay. Um, what we decided we would do tonight after questions is that we would do a breakout. Um, and I don't know if every single board member from Shy Hack Night will be there, but a number of the board members, especially ones on the DEI committee, will be in that breakout. And we can spend part of the time diving in a little deeper into some of these questions and some of the time figuring out how Shy Hack Night can move forward. So if you're interested in learning more or if you feel like you want to be a part of the process to move Shy Hack Night forward, um, that would be uh, where you want to be. I don't have a watch, so I don't know how much time we have left. Five. Five minutes? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so I think we can open up for Q&A, but what we do want is for you all to actually think about these things. What is something new that you learned today? Like, take 10 seconds, think about it. And how can you personally make this space better for marginalized people? And this isn't for show, right? Think about that. Choose one thing that you're going to do moving forward for Shy Hack Night that makes this space better for marginalized people. So. 
Okay. Hello. Um, so sometimes it's challenging to be with an organization and then um, try to, on the one hand, want to just be a uh, regular everyday person in the organization, but on the other, recognize a responsibility to advance areas that directly affect people like you or yourself. Um, I'm wondering how you see people negotiate that. So. Um, I don't always want to be the diversity, equity, inclusion person in my organization. And then at the same time, I have a responsibility to advance that because it's directly affecting myself and then people like myself. Um, how do you see people negotiate that, that balance? That's a really great question. So when you are the person who is experiencing some kind of oppression in the workplace, how do you keep yourself from being the token complainer all the time, or token fixer even. Um, there are lots of approaches to this. Me personally, my approach was to find my allies in the office. Um, so I paid attention to the white people who were nodding when I was saying what I was saying, as opposed to the white people who were like looking away and like pretending it wasn't happening, right? And then I talked to them, and I talked to them about how exhausting it was to, in every meeting, have to defend myself in a particular way or to have to talk about diversity all the time and to be the only person talking about it. And I invited them to support me. I invited them to, when they notice, also speak up. And I sort of frame it as both a challenge and as sort of like a a recognition, like an award. Like, I've noticed that you care, and that's really great. And that's not just to hand out cookies, but it's true, right? Because not all non-oppressed people care. And if you find the people who do care, they can help you, and they can take on a lot of that weight because they don't have to deal with the emotional impact themselves. <laughs> okay, another question back here. Uh, hello. So I came across a situation which touches upon uh, a point that you made about reverse um, racism or so forth. So in a company where the CEO hired a director of HR who is of color, uh, situations have arised where that director has wanting to have a lot of power and thus pulled uh, a trump card, so to speak, where it says, if it's not what I say, why do you hire me? In which case, it creates a very awkward situation of although the power is not there, organizationally speaking, there is this reverse kind of psychology of why did you hire me if you don't listen to me? even though in certain situations that opinion is really of no, um, of no valid reason. So what do you make out of that? You're saying this is the HR person in charge is saying if, that it has to be their way? Right. And it's a person of color who's HR. Right. So in the hiring of further, employees, you see how it becomes a situation where it's like, well, if it's not on my terms, on which terms it is, and then say the CEO can't make a legit hire. Yeah, so oftentimes people of color get hired in these positions as a scapegoat, right? A company might think, we're, we don't have any racial diversity at this organization, we're gonna hire a person of color at the top and they're gonna fix it. But like we talked about, it's systemic. You can't just have tokenism. You can't just hire a person of color in HR and expect for all the problems to go away. And so now, if that person is failing to create change, here's what's gonna happen. They're gonna get fired and they're gonna get blamed for everything that, happened, that went wrong. And then your company is gonna be right back where they started and they've been scapegoated. And that's actually really, really common. It happens all the time at all kinds of organizations. The other thing that I'll add to that is um, this idea that when you've had a certain level of privilege, any movement from that 
starts to feel like a threat, even when it's not, right? And so if um, more people of color are being hired and more religious holidays are being recognized on the office calendar and blah, 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 on and on and on, right? It starts to feel like things are being taken away from the people who have always had those privileges. But it's not. And that's really, really hard to grapple with emotionally. And we recognize that, right? We said this is not easy. But that's what's happening, is people are feeling like something is being taken away from them, but it's not. It's just being given to other people, too. Um, I want to start by saying, um, whenever I do racial equity work, as a white person, I never do it alone. Why don't I do it alone? Because Prana and my other partners have a perspective that I don't have. I've never experienced racism. And it's also very unseemly for me to get up in front of a group like this and teach about racism by myself as though I'm some expert and I've never experienced it. So what you just saw was me hearing a question. I'm not even sure why the race of the HR person is relevant. That's where my mind is going. I'm not sure what the relevance of them being a person of color is. And Prana is able to find a whole bunch of other layers because she's got a whole bunch of different experiences than I do. So right here, what you're seeing is the value of having different world experiences in every environment because Prana brings things to the table that I just don't. And I've been doing this work a long time, but I, I, like, I didn't even think of any of that. So there's exactly what the point is. <laughs> We have another question from over here. Hi, um, I kind of have a systemic question about the systemic issue that you're addressing. Uh, it's kind of a curiosity. So uh, the work that you guys do as consultants essentially is to help organizations, companies become more equitable. And I'm kind of curious what you see as like the incentive or motivation that is pushing these organizations to actually like go through the effort of trying to do that, right? Because it sounds like really hard, and especially if you are in a position of power and privilege, like, why, like, you know, why would you want to try to change that? So I'm kind of, kind of curious to hear, like, what seems to be motivating people. Yeah. Um, well, I think we can both answer that question. So I have a client right now that is um, an environmental non nonprofit, and they have two reasons. One is that they care about their constituents, and they have a global constituency, and so they're concerned for the equity of the people that they're working with and that they're serving. And the other is that they know it's impressive. They know that if they get this right, other organizations are going to look to them as an example, and that's a notch in their belt, and they're really excited about that. It's cool to be anti-racist. Yeah, it's kind of gross. Being anti-racist is becoming trendy, and so you never know the, the motives of anybody you talk to, because it's like, yeah, I'm into anti-racism, cool. Um, <laughs> and they don't get it at all. So with my clients, what I see is a number of different things. Number one, they felt pressure either by their board or others to hire for diversity. And once you hire for diversity, you either have to get with the program or you're gonna have a mess. And so a lot of them are doing it because they feel the pressure from outside or inside to do it. Um, and so they wanna do a half a day workshop on implicit bias, which is like, yeah, you're not serious about this. Um, and then the organizations that are really serious about doing the very best work in Chicago or elsewhere, because let's be honest, these folks are working with the most marginalized people in our communities and have the most potential to do harm ultimately because they have that access. And they don't do this work, and you saw on the iceberg white savior. I mean, I was a white savior. There's no doubt in my mind when I worked in nonprofits that I spent a lot of years, I'm going to rescue those people. Um, and so the ones who are serious about it and really get it are doing it because they get that it's important and they understand that if they really are serious about their mission, this is the only way they're going to get there. And so they take it very seriously and they understand that it, it costs money and time and that it's going to be forever and that they're going to have to keep investing in it. And we're lucky in Chicago, we have some foundations that have done a lot of work on this. Field Foundation, Woods Fund Chicago, some of these other foundations have done some real serious work about it. If you look at, I think Field Foundation has a heat map on their website where they service in Chicago. And you can see their list of vendors and who they use. And they've gone down to really granular levels 
to be more equitable in what they do. So if you're serious about it, you have to do this work. Uh, I have a question from the doc and then over here. Um, so when people say privilege, can you define it more? I think that's a misunderstood term. Um, so privilege, people think that privilege means that you've had an easy road. That's not what it's like at all. Prana and I could come from the same socioeconomic background. Like our, our parents could make the same amount of money. We could go to the same school. We could live in the same kind of house, have everything exactly the same. It's still going to be harder for Prana because when she goes anywhere, people see her skin color before they see anything else. And when I go, I'm this white person. So privilege just means that you have a barrier either put in front of you or taken away with everything else being equal. It's not saying that you didn't have to work hard. It's not saying that you didn't have struggles. There are lots of poor white people. There are lots of trans white people. There are lots of LGBT, LGBT white people. There are lots of disabled white people. It doesn't mean their life isn't hard as hell. Layer color on there, it's harder. That's all it means. Color, race, just makes it harder. Thanks. So you guys mentioned that um, you can't just hire for diversity and hope that uh, your company becomes more diverse. But can you share some strategies then to make it more diverse? And also what happens, so say you have a few hires and they are diverse hires which again, that's not the point, but it's, at some point you might have an all white organization, an all male organization, you need to make it more diverse. So what happens for those first few people? How do you make them more comfortable and open up the organization? And then how does it go from like an organization, how does it go from non-diverse to a diverse organization? Like what does that look like in a healthy, productive way? Um, there are a lot of ways, but essentially the answer is kind of the same. Um, whether you're diverse or not diverse, you start by doing um, some work, some learning as a team, starting to understand how race equity works and how inequity works. Um, and making sure that you're centering, if you have people of color in your organization, center them. Check in with them. Don't expect them to lead the initiative, but if they do lead the initiative, it should be paid. You can't place on top of people who are already burdened when they walk in the door of your office that additional burden of, oh, you're black, you can lead our diversity initiative. No. If they lead it because they want to, they should get paid for it. Um, and then if you're, I, I assume you could do this in the business community as well. In the nonprofit community, what I do is I say, I want you to find a people of color, primarily black or indigenous led organization, and I want you to go support them, and I don't want you looking for anything in return. And I want you as a staff to start figuring out how you can be anti-racist 24 seven. I don't want you to come here and tell me your whole network of people is white. I don't want you to tell me that you spend all your money at white stores. I don't want you to tell me that you're, you're anti-racist at work and then you leave and you go back to your white world. It has to be every person on staff has to decide, um, and those who don't decide may find it so uncomfortable that they want to leave. It's, you can't fix it tomorrow. It's a process. But first start doing the learning, whether you hire someone if you have the budget or if you don't have the budget. Look, I have a spreadsheet filled with resources. I'm happy to share it with anybody for free that's got hundreds of resources. The internet is great. It's loaded with resources. Do a, a brown bag lunch. Do um, ask everybody to read an article. Make it part of your evaluation process for staff to have some competency when it comes to these issues. There are ways to start building it in to how you do things. Research how to hire equitably, how to evaluate equitably, how to promote equitably, and how to provide the support system that the people of color in your organization need in order to be successful. And you just keep every month, every year, you keep getting better at it. But at least if you're trying, it's a good start. You wanna add? Okay, so there's a question over here. Um, I think we have time for one more. Um, so I saw your hand first, so um, there will, you'll be sticking around afterwards and there will be um, a breakout afterwards. I can just do that. Okay, is it gonna 
Should I just turn it off? Oh dear. Just trying to get it back. Oh, there we go. So. I just wanted to ask two things, I guess, real fast. What's the brown bag lunch thing you just mentioned now? And also from the iceberg, what do you mean by expecting people of color to explain everything? Yeah. Um, so I think when Heidi mentioned brown bag lunch, she meant like a lunch and learn, like encourage everybody to bring their lunch into a conference room and we're going to have this conversation instead of you eating it at your desk while you're doing something else or you know however else your company has lunch culture. Um, and then expecting people of color to teach white people everything. Um, we often encounter an expectation that um, you know, people of color know more about racism than white people do, right? That's just obvious because we've experienced it and, and white folks have it, so we know more. That doesn't mean that if a white person is trying to learn about racism, that they should expect that I, for example, am going to be able to explain it to them, or that I should explain it to them, or that I owe it to them to explain it to them, or any other thing, right? We all have Google. We all have access to Google. We can all look things up. That doesn't mean that you can't ask questions. You can absolutely ask questions. You also have to accept when somebody doesn't want to answer your question, and maybe that means you go to a different person, or you spend more time Googling, or you say, do you have a suggestion for a thing I should Google instead? There are a lot of ways that this can be approached, but what's happening that we see pretty frequently is there's just heavy, heavy weight of expectation that people of color are going to do all of the teaching and all of the explaining. And so not only do we have to deal with racism in our lives, then we have to rehash it for you on the weekend. For free. For free. Yeah. Last question. So I just really wanted to say thank you for doing this. Um, and I just wanted to circle back and touch on something you said earlier about um, just about how you know, you're often put in the position of having to answer people's questions or to raise awareness and how exhausting it can be to be the complainer. Um, so as someone with trauma, and I think anyone who shares like trauma that comes from you know, white supremacy and experiences of racism, trauma has a way of replacing your habits of connection with habits of protection because you put up boundaries, because you don't want to have to re-expose yourself to something, reconnect to people who continually take that connection and then abuse it. So for me, um, I'm in a situation where, um, you know, I do notice uh, radicalized language that is, you know, coming from a supremacist place or is coming from a place that's gen like sidelining or creating a, a um, you know, a hostile environment, and I am looking for my allies, um, and I know I have to, you know, keep doing that work because what else am I going to do, but can you speak to folks in this room about how to respond to a person of color who is asking them to respond, like, step up to the challenge of being yeah. an ally? Yeah, first of all, I'm really sorry that you're experiencing all of that. I can't say that I'm surprised, but I am sad. Um, in my last job, I excelled at like the job that I was supposed to be doing, but every single review that I got back said that I was like cold and mean and angry. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, I am. <laughs> and she's not. I'm also really friendly and really nice, but when you're racist, I am cold and mean and angry. <laughs> Uh, so that's a really common trope, right? I think every woman has experienced this, every person of color has experienced this, and women of color in particular feel it doubly, that they're mean and they're angry because they're dealing with this trauma, right? And it, it is trauma to have to deal with this oppression day in and day out in the workplace and at home and on the CTA and everywhere you exist in the world. So the question was, what, what can you do about it when you're so traumatized and people just think you're not nice? I just wanted to give the backdrop because it, when I do reach out to my allies, yeah. um, I hope they, they can see that 
it's taking me a lot of extra energy expended to convert a habit of protection into a habit of connection and hope that they are going to hear what I have to say. Yeah. So how, like, how from the other side can they bridge that gap? So I know you ask Prana, but I have an answer to white people. Um, I think what we need to be doing in what, with, as white people, and I did a talk for General Assembly and a whole bunch of other people at a women's tech breakfast, and what I said was, it is on us to look for the opportunities, not to rescue, not to swoop in without permission, but to walk up to Prana and say, Prana, I know that sometimes it can be really hard to be a person of color at this place. I want you to know that I see you and I'm here for you. And if there's something that I can do for you that would be helpful to back you up, to have your back, I'm not going to swoop in because you know best what you need. But if I can do something to support you, you know that you can reach out to me anytime. It also means when Prana isn't present and you hear shit from people that is racist, and problematic, you speak up. Did I miss anything? <laughs> That's great. Now you all heard that challenge, and now you have to live into it. Yeah. There's no excuse now because Heidi told you what to do. <laughs> I think that's a great way to end this. So thank you so much.